right. Everybody move on that side. I gotta look on this side now. <laughs> Y'all ready to have Bible study tonight? All right, well, let's do it. Welcome, one and all. And let's look to the Lord in prayer as we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for this Bible study, the opportunity, Lord God, to be in your house. We thank you for your word. We pray tonight that you will bless this Bible study. Let the Holy Spirit speak, guide us, and help us. I pray for your grace and mercy to be with us tonight as we continue to study your word. We thank you and appreciate you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in Acts chapter 3. The working of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believers. And so tonight we want to look at miracles in Jesus' name. For the title for tonight, Acts chapter 3. Because uh, here in, in this chapter we'll see that a great miracle took place with the help, you know. A great miracle took place. What's, what's going on? Okay, <laughs> and she had a smile on her face like something's wrong. <laughs> Come on, her right there. But this great miracle took place, and and it really caused thing to, things to um, people to, to draw people as people's attention, and and in, 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 in a sense, it of course it it helped the gospel of Jesus Christ to go forward, and so we want to look at that tonight. This miracle that took that Peter and John were able to perform in the name of Jesus, but it was all done by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so tonight, as we look at, I want to look at John chapter 16, verse 14, for a text, or for a, a, a verse that we want to use to back up this story we'll talk about, where Jesus speaking about the Holy Ghost in Acts 16, 14. He said, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. And so that's what the Holy Spirit is doing. It's just everything he does through the lives of the believers is to glorify Jesus. It's to let Christ, to let the people know that even though Jesus is gone from the earth, his power and his presence is still among them working but now in the form of the Holy Ghost. And so really we can say that the Holy Ghost is continuing the work of Jesus through signs and miracles, but now He's using the disciples to do it. He's using the disciples to do it. And that's the same thing we can say today of the church. Jesus is still being glorified. Jesus is still being lifted up on high. Jesus is still being promoted and preached. He's still being elevated above all, but is done through us, the believers, and working through us. The Holy Ghost working through Christians, through believers, and the whole purpose is to glorify Jesus, to lift Him up continuously, that He's not out of the picture. He's still the one that's getting all the glory. Amen. He's still the one that's getting all the praise. And so we'll dive into chapter 3 and talk about what took place here and see how the Holy Ghost is still doing His work. It's in chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And really, that's, that alone speaks of something that I believe, really, it's needed in every church. And that is prayer meeting. Prayer meeting really helped the church grow. When we can meet together and pray together, it's really a needed thing. And, and here we find in the church here that even though the apostles were busy, you know, uh, Holy Ghost poured out, revival break out, they did not stop going to the house of the Lord to pray. And we know that the Jews, they had three hours of prayer. They had a, a third hour of prayer, then they had a sixth hour of prayer. And then they had the ninth hour of prayer, and which will be equivalent, the third hour will be 9 o'clock, the sixth hour will be 12 p.m., the, th the ninth hour will be 3 p.m. And so they had these three scheduled per prayer meeting, and here we find these apostles, Peter and John, 
going to the temple to pray. What a blessing. What a blessing to have people go to the, uh, go to the house of the Lord to pray. And, and, and we, we see this also demonstrated in the life of Daniel. Remember in the Old Testament, the Bible said Daniel prayed three times a day. He was following the same thing, the same trend they have here of the three separate times of prayer, 9 a.m., 12 p.m., and 3 p.m. But here the, the apostles were going, the apostles were going to this prayer meeting at 9 or 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And alike as they were going, it seems like the Holy Ghost positioned them in this situation where they could glorify God and at the same time that God could give them, uh, or God can make them uh, someone that the people could look to for the gospel to be preached to them. The Bible said there in verse 2, he said, And a certain man lame, as they, in verse 1, they went up at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, 3 p.m. In verse 2, he said, And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that enter. situation where these uh, apostles are going to the house of prayer. They're going to the temple. They're going to pray. They're going to seek God. But while they were going, they were busy about serving God, busy about praising God, busy about prayer. God had something for them to do. And if you think about it, the Bible said this man, if you read on later on in the book of Acts, he was over 40 years old. That this miracle took place on. But the thing that I like and the thing that I marvel about the most is that uh, they said that they took him there daily. They took him there daily at the temple, right? And so it was a daily thing that this man was being brought and set at this beautiful gate of the temple. But for some strange reason, or maybe it was by design, <laughs> Right? That Jesus never, because Jesus was at the temple, the Bible said right before they, they crucify him, he was daily at the temple preaching the gospel. But he never healed this man. He never healed him. He was leaving him for a greater glory. He was, leaving, no doubt, left him there so that, uh, because everybody knew this man. Everybody knew that he was lame. Day after day, they brought him. Day after day, he sat by the temple. People going in and out of the temple, they're seeing this man. But Jesus himself never healed him. But in my mind, he saved this miracle. So that when he did, when he will, when he, when he did heal him, everybody will know that these apostles were operating under the same power that Jesus was operating under. And so it's amazing how God works a lot of times. He doesn't do everything. He leaves certain things for us to do. Amen. He leaves certain things for us to do so that we can, number one, glorify him. And number two, we can let people know that we do represent God. And that God is working in us and through us to fulfill his glory. So the Bible said, it seems like the Holy Ghost positioned this. He said, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that enter into the temple. In verse 3, he said, Who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alm. And that's another thing we can point out there is that the reason why they put him at the temple to ask alm is that the people, when they come to the temple, whether it was praying or anything, they always brought offering to give. And so the man knew that, and so he knew that if they were going into the temple, uh, they probably got some money they're going to give to God, and then they can give some to, to charity also. But what he didn't realize was <laughs> he was talking to some preacher that had no money. <laughs> you see, he's talking to the wrong set of guys. These guys had nothing when it comes to monetary thing. They had no money, silver and gold. But... What he didn't understand was they had something far better than money, right? They had something far better than money, something that he couldn't do even if he had money, something he couldn't do for himself even if he had all the money in the world. Maybe nobody there were able or, or skilled enough to fix him. But there's a God, amen? There's a God that could do it. And so Jesus, he, he saved this miracle for these apostles, and so as, as the man approached them and asked an arm, the Bible said in verse 4, 
And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. This has always been a favorite scripture of mine. I love this because I didn't preach a message from it once. The title was, Give What You Have. And it has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with offering. It has nothing to do with tithes. It just have everything to do with we have God. We have God. We have the Spirit of God. We have the love of God in our life. We have the knowledge of God in us. We know the Bible, and so we can give the world what we have. And we can look at the world and say, silver and gold, have I none? Well, there's something I have. There's something I have. I can tell you about a man named Jesus. I can share with you a, a, the Redeemer. I can share with you the knowledge of the Savior, the one who died for the sins of the entire world. I can share with you this uh, knowledge of someone who can do miracles, someone who can change lives, someone who can transform minds and hearts and who can heal the broken and who can take uh, uh, an individual who is, uh, who is not well uh, and heal them and, and fix them and, and give them a brand new start in life. I may not have all money to give to everybody, but I got Jesus. Amen. That Jesus is still a Savior, a life changer. That Jesus is still the great physician and he can heal. And that's really what God wants. He wants us to glorify Christ. He wants us as Christians to always remember there is something we can give. Amen. There's something we can give. Yes, God expects tithe and offering, but that's just a small part. That's just an obligation that we support the work of the Lord, but there's so much more that God, that we can do for God. Amen? Amen. Let's think about it. Every soul we reach, that's even a greater blessing. Yes. Right? Every soul, we, every life we impact with Jesus, that's a greater blessing. Uh, every person that we win for Christ, that's a greater blessing. And so that's what Peter was you know, showing to the man. The man want, wanted money. He wanted an arm, which is why he was there. But he didn't realize that day that God had something greater for him. And that, 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 that the Spirit of God could, could do so much more for him instead of just giving him something that he will run out of the very next day. Right. You know, yeah, I could have given him some money, but he's going to spend it on something. And then he's going to be right back at the gates begging again. And I give him some more money again, and then the next day he'll be right back at the gate begging again. Oh, what he needed was a touch from God. And thank God, thank God. There were two apostles. There were two men that had God in their life. There were two men that were allowing the Holy Ghost to use them. There were two men that were going to the house of prayer, walking with God, talking with God. And when the, when the opportunity was presented to them, they realized, wait a minute, I may not have what he's asking for or what he think he wants or what he wants, but I do have what he needs. And, and they said, he said Peter, the Bible said, Peter fastened his eyes on him, upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and, and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat at, for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And so here we find the Holy Ghost working in a miraculous way to glorify Jesus. Because what we'll find here is after the Holy Ghost healed, after this man was healed by, by uh, Peter and John, you know, revealing to him that they could help him in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
all of a sudden, all glory and honor turn to God. God did this. Amen? God did this. And so that's the beautiful thing about the Holy Ghost working in us is that at the end of the day, and we'll see this even more, at the end of the day, God gets all the glory. But we have to let God use us. We have to make ourselves available to the Lord and realize that as a Christian, <laughs> we do have something to give this world. Right? As a child of God, we do have something to give this world. We may not have all the answers that the world is looking for, but we do have the answer. And that is faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ. Give the, uh, give the world what you have. Give them, give them what you have. You have Jesus. Give them in verses 11 through 16 which is another important section here, is that as we allow the Holy Ghost to use us as Christians, we allow the Spirit of God to work in us, and we're praying like these apostles were, and we're seeking God, and we're letting God use us. We must always remember that uh, in the end, God is the one that gets the glory. God is the one that gets the glory, and a, a true apostle will always give God the glory. You know, I, I get a kick at, at sometimes I look at clips that people post and, you know, from churches, especially in Africa, South Africa, and, different, and probably even America too. But I've seen quite a few in South Africa. And these prophets, they're comparing who's the greater prophet. Who can call down fire from heaven? Who can, who can raise the dead? And, and then they go back and prove that it's all a gimmick, you know? Uh, and, and, but the thing is, there and, and they have this big show and this big display about who the great, who's greater. They'll compete. They'll send spies into the other camp to spy out the other prophets and different things. And it's all about, you know, who is the greater prophet? Who's doing the greatest miracle? Who is healing? Who's doing all that? But that's not God because the Bible said, let no flesh glory in his presence. And if God will use a, an individual for anything, that individual will always remember to give God the glory because it is God that's doing the work in that man. And so a true apostle will always give God the glory. They will never brag or boast about how great of an apostle or prophet they are. They will also look at themselves as I am nothing without Jesus and, the only, and only by His grace I am what I am. And so that's what we see here demonstrated by Peter and John as they, God used them to heal this man. All the people knew this. It's like I said, it was a special miracle because the people that were going in and out of the temple knew this man. And so after he was healed, the Bible said the people took notice of it. And in verse 11, the Bible said, as the lame, And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, had glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the Just One, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God had raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, had made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him had given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So here we have this great miracle took place, and and, and, and instead of the apostles getting all lifted up in pride and say, you know what, uh, man, look what we've done. We, we healed this man and all the people ran and they're looking at them and, and everything. They just say, hey, we didn't do this. This is not our power. 
This is not a, a display of our holiness, of our righteousness in God. He's saying this is all God doing. God is glorifying his son, Jesus Christ. I notice he talked to them because they understood this. He told them that the God of their father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he said he had glorified his son. He was letting them know that this Jesus that you crucified, and I love the way Peter said this, said this to them, he said the one that you denied, not realizing that he denied him also, right? <laughs> At one time, but thank God he, he accepted the forgiveness, forgiveness of God and he moved on with his life and said, you know what, yes, I messed up, I failed, but God forgive me, I'm going to move on. And so he was able with the boldness of God to say to them, you deny him, you turn him over to be crucified, but he is still, and, and, you, and he was crucified, he died, but he's still among us, he's still working. And so he's letting them know that this same Jesus that they rejected, even though he wasn't there in, per in person any longer, he was still reaching out to them in love by his power still being demonstrated to heal and to help, just like he did when he was on the earth with them. And we know that Jesus did many miracles. He healed the blind. He opened the ears of the deaf. He caused the dumb to speak. He raised the dead back to life. All those miracles that Jesus did, Peter was letting him know, He's still doing it. He's not here with us physically, but he's still doing the same miracles. He's still doing the same work. The only difference is now he's working through his people. Amen? He's still doing the same work. He's still saving. He's still helping. He's still healing. He's still strengthening. He's still doing all these great things. Jesus is still working, but he's working through those who have faith in him and who trust him and who believe in him. And so that's the thing tonight. And, and I love what Peter said. He said, it's not by our holiness and our, and, and our godliness that we did this. He said, this is all God. It's all God. And so that's a, a very important thing to remember that everything, in everything, God still get the glory. Amen. In everything, God still get the praise. It's not man. You say, well, well, this great preacher did this and this great preacher did that. And, and he may be a, a great preacher and everything and, and faith and all that stuff. And we're not taking anything away from the, from the preacher, from the man, but it is still God. Amen. It is still God. A preacher cannot do anything. A prophet, an apostle cannot do anything except God working through them. Except the Holy Ghost working through them. And so the whole theme is the Holy Ghost is still working through his people. And you know, Jesus said we will do greater things than he did, right? He said we will, we will pray and, and all these things and, and, and the sick will recover. He said all these things we will do, greater things we will do in his name. And so we have to remember that, that God is still, still glorifying his son, Jesus, unto this very day. He's still glorifying his son, Jesus. But who is he going to use? Us, his people. Amen. He's going to use us, his people, to continue the work that he started over 2,000 years ago. And uh, in verses 17 through 26, we hear a second message from Peter. And really, the, the message is still the same. It's about repentance. He said in verse 17, he told them that God was the one that did, all, that did the miracle. God was the one that healed. And now he's saying to them, he said, And now, brethren, I would not, or I know not, I would not, or I know that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he had so fulfilled. Verse 19, he said, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Thank God for a time of refreshing. Amen. And we all need it from time to time, a time of refreshing, refreshing our spirit in God and everything. But I like what he said there. He said, repent ye therefore and be converted. Notice he didn't say anything about water baptism. He said repent. So repentance is really get the job done. Repent and change. Convert means to change. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come 
from the presence of the Lord. In verse 20, he said, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God had spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. And that's a serious thing there because he was speaking to, to these Jewish people. And we know unto this very day, a lot of Jews do not believe in Jesus at all. I listen to a lot of podcasts about Jewish and stuff like that. And some of them, it's amazing at their response when it comes to Jesus. They don't even believe he's a prophet. They just believe, you know, they're, they're, sometimes they're taking Jesus' worse than the sinners, uh, you know, the Gentiles, you know. Um, but at the same time, God is still reaching out and saving other Jews. There are many other Jews that are turning to Christ and getting saved. So God is still working. But what he said there that, that it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet, the prophet there was Jesus that he was talking about, shall be destroyed from among the people. So it's a very sad thing to know that the one to whom salvation came to and the one from whom salvation was brought to the world, yet unto this very day they, they die without his mercy. Amen. And that's, that's a sad thing. Because the Bible said that salvation is of the Jews. You know, it was from the Jews that the salvation that Jesus came, and it was from the Jews that the Gentile world was brought, the salvation of the Lord. It wasn't from Gentiles. All the apostles that went out and preached were Jewish. And so they're the one, even Paul the Apostle, being a Jew, brought us the good news of the gospel. But yet the people of God, the Israelites, are still being blinded unto this very day. For one simple thing is because they will not. Listen to Jesus. And it's the same thing today in our world, that salvation has come to the entire world through Jesus Christ, but yet people do not want to believe in Christ. They don't want to accept Him as their Lord and Savior. They do not want to surrender their life to Him. They do not want to allow Him to become the Lord over their life. And that's the only reason why they're being destroyed. It's not that God is prejudiced or God is partial in His... Uh, in His grace and mercy, it is a simple fact that people do not want to believe Jesus Christ. And some will even go as far as say, well, I believe God, but I will not believe Jesus. Or I accept God, but I will not accept Jesus. If you don't accept the, the Son, you cannot accept the Father. For no man can come unto the Father but by the Son. Amen? We need the Son if we want to get to the Father. And so verse 24 he said, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying, Unto Abraham and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Thank God for that. that salvation through Jesus Christ is brought to the entire world that whosoever wants to be saved, if they will listen and hear Jesus, they can be saved. And then the last verse is verse 26. We'll stop with that. He said, Unto you first, God having raised up His Son Jesus, send Him to bless you in turning every one of you from, turning away every one of you from His iniquity. And so He was showing these people that God really loved them and cared about them. And that even though they didn't understand what they were doing when they rejected Christ, and when they listened to their elders and they rejected Christ and, and crucify Him, Peter was letting them know that God still sent salvation to you first. Isn't that great how merciful and loving God is? Even though the Jews were the one that rejected Him and turned Him over to the Gentiles to be crucified, God still, He still reached out to them first. 
he still reached out to them first. He still opened the hearts of many of them. And you will see from this, thousands of them turned to the Lord because God is so gracious and merciful in his ways. And the greatest blessing really that, that we will ever receive from the Lord is salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. He said in verse 26, one more time, Unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning every one of you from his iniquity. The greatest blessing is to be free from sin. The greatest blessing is to be free from the power of sin because if sin is ruling our life, then we know God is not in control of our life. And so to be free from sin is to become the servant of God. So that means we have yielded ourselves to God and we are his servant, and we are in his kingdom, and we are part of his family. And so the greatest blessing, as he said in verse 26, is God turning us away from sin, from iniquity, from things that are destructive to our life. The greatest blessing is to have Jesus in your life. And so he shows you that, uh, that, that the Holy Ghost is still working. And even though Jesus, the miracle worker, the true miracle worker, even though he's gone... God hasn't stopped working miracles. Amen? He hasn't stopped working healing. These things are still for the church. And the reason why is because now it's being operated through the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost working. That's what the whole chapter really, I want to sum it up with, is that the work of God never stopped. With Jesus dying and rising from the dead and ascending back into heaven, really, it just intensify and it grew even stronger because now the gospel can go to all parts of the world and miracles can still happen salvation can still happen it can all happen but now it's being done by the operation of the holy ghost through the believers and so we'll close it with that tonight god is still working through his people amen god we just got to let him we just got to be like peter and john give ourselves to prayer and be available to give the world what we have. Father, thank you for the Bible study tonight. We love you and appreciate you. We ask God that you continue to bless your people. Thank you for your presence here tonight. Have your way. Move and accomplish your will in our life. We give all praise and glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen.